Good evening, everyone. Well, tonight we're going to talk about the meaning of rest. And this is one of the issues that divides Adventism from the rest of Protestantism. Although there have always been those that were inclined to keep the Sabbath, even in Protestantism. So let's look at some of the issues as to what this really entails and why is it important. Divine rest. Exodus 31.13 says, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbaths ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am the Lord that sanctify you. So the Sabbath is a symbol, a sign, a mark, if you like, of sanctification. And it is a sanctification that lies outside of yourself. It's not something you do. It's something that God does because it says you keep the Sabbath that you may know that I am the Lord that does sanctify you. He does the work. And if we look at the reason for the Sabbath, then uh, we can go all the way back to Genesis. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 1, after the creation account, account, we read, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in it he rested from all his work which God created and made. I mean, it's pretty adamant there as to why you keep the Sabbath, right? Three times it says that. Which he had made, which he had made. God created and made, and he rested. Now, surely he wasn't tired, so why did he rest? He found rest in this completed work. If we go to Psalms, we hear that it is that he created this world as an answer to silence his enemies. Fascinating stuff. And if you go to Exodus, then you have the Sabbath commandment in chapter 20. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day, that's the one on which he rested, is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, thy daughter, thy manservant, thy maidservant, cattle, stranger, and those that are within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So the Sabbath is a memorial to creation. Now, how much did humanity contribute to creation? Nothing. Nothing. Adam was created... After everything had been created, every animal was there already, the whole earth was complete, then Adam was created. And he got to name the animals, but he had no contribution to make in the creation. Eve came only after Adam had a snooze. And she didn't even have anything to do with that. So... Humanity had nothing to contribute to creation. And that is why it said up there, thus the heavens and the earth were finished. It's a very finite word, finished. Nothing to add to it. So by keeping the Sabbath, I'm acknowledging a completed work. Is that correct? It's important that we note that. Now, the Sabbath, can you do with it what you want to? Is it changeable? What is the situation? Well, Jesus kept the Sabbath, but pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. So he even admonished 
that the Sabbath would be kept in the future, after he departed. Jesus' followers kept the Sabbath, and they returned and prepared spices and ointment and rested the Sabbath day according to the commandment. So the disciples, the women, they kept the commandments, they kept the Sabbath day. And Paul, what about him? He, as his manner was, went unto them, and three Sabbath day reasoned with them out of the Scriptures. So everywhere in the Scriptures you see that the Sabbath throughout the Old Testament and in the New Testament was kept. Now what about Sabbath keeping through the ages? Because today we keep the first day of the week, or most people do, and the Sabbath seems to be, well, one of those strange things. And if you keep the Sabbath, then people will say, well, aren't you legalistic? Aren't you keeping the Sabbath of the Jews? Now, the Sabbath didn't originate with the Jews because it originated in Eden. There were no Jews in Eden. There was only an Adam and Eve. So is it legalistic to keep it or is it obedience to keep it? Are you keeping it in order to get points with God? Or are you keeping it because you are acknowledging him as your creator? Now, Sabbath keeping through the ages is actually very fascinating. Josephus, who's probably uh, one of the most famous historians of the early church, and he lived in those first century after, after Christ, he wrote the following, There is not any city of the Grecians nor any of the barbarians, nor any nation whatsoever, whither our custom of resting on the seventh, seventh day has not come. He's talking about Christian churches keeping the Sabbath. So the whole area that was governed by Rome had been introduced to the Sabbath. India, China, Persia. What about those countries? Let's read the history books. This is Shaif, the new encyclopedia of religious knowledge. Widespread and enduring was the observance of the seventh-day Sabbath amongst the believers of the Church of the East and the St. Thomas Christians of India, who never were connected with Rome. It also was maintained amongst those bodies which broke off from Rome after the Council of Chalcedon, namely the Abyssinians, the Jacobites, the Maronites, and the Armenians. So they all kept the Sabbath. It's interesting that the Christians in India were called St. Thomas Christians because Thomas, the disciple, preached as far as India. And obviously, he established churches that kept the Sabbath. And many, many years later, I'm talking now about the 1600s, when the Jesuit order was formed to counter the Reformation, and the message was starting to move into the world because migrations took place to North America and to Africa and all these nations, when Vasco da Gama with his ships went round the Horn of Africa to find the trade routes to, to India, Jesuits were on board. And this is how Jesuitism spread to the entire world as it was being discovered, and they were largely responsible for controlling many of the areas like South America and uh, all of these eastern areas where they became established. And on one of those trips, with one of those ships of Vasco da Gama round the Horn of Africa, when Africa was just being uh, discovered and colonized in those early years, St. Francis Xavier, I don't know whether we should call him St. Francis Xavier, let's just call him Francis Xavier, one of the co-founders of the Jesuit order was on one of those ships and when he came to India, he discovered, lo and behold, Christians in India. He was stunned. And what was really amazing to him is that they kept the Sabbath, the seventh day, and not the Sunday, which Rome 
was keeping. And so he wanted to eliminate this practice immediately, and they instituted the Inquisition in Goa to suppress the Thomasite Christians. So, interesting history. So that early area, and China, as far as Japan, were Sabbath-keeping Christians. It's fascinating when you study that history, and you even study the history of Mongolia, and uh, the Mongolian invasion into Europe, there were Sabbath keepers amongst them, and they had been influenced by Christianity. And much of the Chinese writing and the Japanese writing actually contains Christian symbols, because Christianity was well established. And only later in history was Christianity eradicated in Japan by the shoguns, for example. And under the influence of the Jesuits, it returned to its previous form of worship. So Sabbath keeping was being eradicated throughout the world. But the early church in India and China and Persia kept the Sabbath. Here's another quote, dialogue on the Lord's Day. The primitive Christians had a great veneration for the Sabbath and spent the day in devotion and sermons. And it is not to be doubted that they derived this practice from the apostles themselves as appears by several scriptures to the purpose. Here's another one, Gisler's church history. The Gentile Christians observed also the Sabbath. As early as A.D. 225, or 225, there existed large bishoprics or conferences of the Church of the East, Sabbath-keeping, stretching from Palestine to India. Here's another source. So these are historic sources which tell us that the early church kept Sabbath throughout its regions. Here's another one. Dissertations on the Lord's Day. The seventh-day Sabbath was solemnized by Christ, the apostles, and primitive Christians till the Laodicean Council did in manner quite abolish the observation of it. When the church in Rome started to keep the Sunday, and that has an interesting history, then Sunday was being kept in Rome and also in Alexandria. And those two regions became Sunday-keeping regions. The rest of Christianity, the great bulk of Christianity, kept Sabbath. The entire church of the East kept the Sabbath day. We will further see, Professor James C. Moffat, Professor of Church History at Princeton says, it seems to have been customary in the Celtic churches, this is interesting, of the early times, in Ireland as well as Scotland. So this idea that Patrick of Ireland was, for example, a Roman Catholic is probably devoid of all truth. He was probably a Sabbath keeper and never put his foot in Rome. But they used his name to gain influence and to twist the situation around so that today they are, of course, Sunday-keeping nations. So in Scotland, to keep the Sabbath, Saturday, the Jewish Sabbath, as a day of rest from labor, they obeyed the fourth commandment literally upon the seventh day of the week. In Ethiopia, now we go to Africa. That's where the eunuch went after he was baptized, right? There, Frumentius writes, and we assemble on Saturday. He continues, not that we are infected with Judaism, but to worship Jesus, the Lord of the Sabbath. Now, before I continue, why was this such a problem? this infection with Judaism. Well, this was because the Jewish revolts over the eons, which resulted in the destruction of Jerusalem, had irked the Romans. And the Romans, of course, had lost many, many soldiers and many lives in all of these Jewish revolts. And in 70 AD, the Romans totally destroyed Jerusalem 
and crucified thousands upon thousands of Jews. The crucifixes were for miles around. And the Jews kept on revolting. They kept on restructuring and revolting because they believed in this messianic uh, prophecy that they would control the world eventually under the Messiah. And in the time of Emperor Hadrian, which was in the around 153 after Christ, there was another Jewish revolt and the Emperor Hadrian had had it up to here, and he destroyed Jerusalem for a second time and crucified even more Jews than in the destruction of 70 AD. And he was so fed up with these Jewish revolts that he banned the Jewish religion and the keeping of the Sabbath day. And so the Christians in Rome had a problem. What now, if they were Sabbath keeping, then that would create a, a negative connotation. And so they adopted the Dies Solus, the day of the sun, which was the pagan day of worship, and said, well, we will baptize this day, and we will call this day dedicated to Jesus, and we'll celebrate it as the day of the resurrection. So that was to distance themselves from the Jewish practice of keeping the Sabbath. That is why they say here, not that we are infected with Judaism, but to worship Jesus, the Lord of the Sabbath. General history of the Sabbatarian church. There's the source, 1851. Notice some of the statements by the Ethiopian emperor, Galadewos. We do celebrate the Sabbath, because God, after he had finished the creation of the world, rested thereon. And that especially since Christ came not to dissolve the Lord, but to fulfill it. It is therefore not in the imitation of the Jews, but in the obedience to Christ and his holy apostles that we observe that day. And the entire Africa was influenced and the nations that were influenced by the Ethiopian Christians kept Sabbath until the Jesuits arrived in Africa and created chaos by dividing the houses of rulership, king against prince, and war broke out, and blood flowed in the streets until eventually the Sabbath was virtually wiped out and they switched over to the Roman practice of keeping Sunday. So, who changed the Sabbath day? Well, Rome did. The Bishop of Rome. And we have this statement from Rome. The Pope has power to change times, to abrogate laws, and to dispense with all things, even the precepts of Christ. Now, that's quite an arrogant statement if you think that you have power over the word. That is incredible. Rome says, of course, the Catholic Church claims that the change was her act, and the act is a mark of her ecclesiastical power and authority in religious matters. And this word, mark there, is exactly the same word and the exact same usage as the mark or the sign or the symbol of God, which refers to the Sabbath day. So they say it is their mark of ecclesiastical power and authority in religious matter that they moved the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. They claim in their Catholic record that Sunday is our mark of authority. The church is above the Bible, and this transference of Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. And in Revelation 14, verse 9, we read, and the third angel followed them, so here's a message to the world, saying with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast, and the reformers all identified the beast as Roman Catholicism, and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, then he will 
suffer the consequences which God lists in uh, the book of Revelation. Now let's just make sure whether the reformers really believed that. These are the notes of John Wesley, his explanatory notes to the Bible. And he's quoting here Revelation chapter 13 verse 1. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and I saw a beast, there's the beast, the one who has the mark, and this beast claims that the mark that it has is that it is above the Bible, and the proof thereof is that they changed the Sabbath to the Sunday. So they say it themselves. And I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. So this is a blasphemous organization. It has an it has a goal to attack God's word and to say that it stands above it. And this is what Wesley says. A wild beast coming up. He comes up twice. First from the sea, then from the abbess. He comes from the sea before the seven files. The great whore comes after them. Oh reader, this is a subject wherein we also are deeply concerned and which we must be treated not as a point of curiosity, but as a solemn warning from God. The danger is near, be armed both against force and fraud, even with the armor, the whole armor of God. Out of the sea, that is Europe, because the Bible says, the waters which you saw are peoples and multitudes and nations and kings, so he will arise out of those. The beast, he says, is the Romish papacy. He doesn't say maybe. He says it is. This is what the reformers believe. As it came to a point 600 years since, stands now and will for some time longer. To this and no other power on earth agrees the whole text and every part of it in every point, as we may see with the utmost evidence from the propositions following. And then he lists all the categories which are listed in these prophecies and points out to the fact that they all fit Rome. Now, we don't have time to go into all of that, but just to show you, this was the Reformed position. And it is still the position today of Rome that it will enforce Sabbath if it has the opportunity. Catholic Online, never on Sunday. Pope Francis says working on Sunday has negative effect on families. Stop working on Sunday. It must be a day of rest. Here's the Lord's Day Alliance of the United States. And it said quite recently, in fact, Sunday is a mark of Christian unity. A rather interesting terminology because the beast claims that it is his mark. And here the Protestant world claims that it is a mark of the unity of the church. And we've seen how that unity has progressed over the last years. Now, do Protestants acknowledge that the Sabbath is the true Sabbath of God, in spite of the fact that they do not keep it, although there have been attempts in the past by Protestants to keep it? The Seventh-day Baptist kept the Sabbath day. There are a number of groups that keep the Sabbath day. Uh, amongst them, the Seventh-day Adventists, of course. What did the Lutherans say about this Sabbath day? The observance of the Lord's Day, Sunday, is founded not on any command of God, but on the authority of the church. This is the Augsburg Confession, which was written by Melanchthon, by the way. They, the Catholics, allege the Sabbath changed into Sunday, the Lord's Day. Contrary to the Decalogue, as it appears, neither is there any example more boasted of than the changing of the Sabbath day. Great, they say, is the power and authority of the church, since it dispensed with one of the Ten Commandments. This is the Augsburg Confession. You cannot get a better source than this. So the Lutherans agree that Rome changed the Sabbath day. Then my question is, why did you not go, go back to what the Bible said? Why did you go along with it? Well, you see, it was 
it was convenient. And there were so many other issues that they were fighting about. They were talking about the Bible, the authority of the Bible. They were talking about uh, the supremacy of Christ. They were talking about justification. They were talking about atonement. They had so many problems that to go and uh, change this now as well was probably too much for them. But it bit them. It bit them in the end. We'll see. What about the Methodists? Do they agree that the Sabbath really is the Saturday and not the Sunday? Let's ask them. This is John Wesley writing. This handwriting of ordinances, our Lord did blot out, take away and nail to his cross, which was the ceremonial law. But the moral law contained in the Ten Commandments and enforced by the prophets, he did not take away. The moral law stands on an entirely different foundation from the ceremonial or ritual law. Every part of this law must remain in force upon all mankind and in all ages. That's John Wesley. They go further. They say, this is the theological dictionary, it's the same sort of source. Sabbath in the Hebrew language signifies rest and is the seventh day of the week. And it must be confessed that there is no law in the New Testament concerning the first day. So the Methodists know? Okay. What about the Baptists? Do they know? There was and is a command to keep holy the Sabbath day, but that Sabbath day is not Sunday. It will, however, be readily said, and with some show of triumph, that the Sabbath was transferred from the seventh to the first day of the week with all its duties, privileges, and sanctions. Earnestly desiring information on this subject, which I have studied for many years, I ask, where can the record of such a transaction be found? Not in the New Testament. Absolutely not. There is no scriptural evidence of the change of the Sabbath institution from the seventh to the first day of the week. And this was written by Hiscox, who is the author of the Baptist manual. Can't get a better Baptist source than that. So they agree. The Sabbath is the day. Now, what happened at the Council of Trent? This is where Rome and Protestantism separated their ways. Let's have a look at this history. This history is more than fascinating. Well, the Jesuits were in control of that council as they were in control of the Second Vatican Council, which led to the reunification process with Protestantism. And it's been very successful, as we have seen. So the influence of the Jesuits was immediately seen when the Pope ignored the imperial command to notify the reformers. You see, the emperor had said, I don't want this strife in my kingdom. You guys get together and you sort this thing out once and for all. And so the Catholic prelates organized the council and they ignored the Protestants and just to reaffirm their own doctrines. But they'd been so confused, some of them, because the reformers really had excellent ideas. Why should the church have the authority and not the Bible? It was a good question. And some of those priests were rattled. And Rome was in a crisis. How were they going to deal with this? Weeks passed. And finally the council organized itself and accepted the following as its first four decrees. Number one, the Vulgate, which was the Latin translation of Jerome, was the true Bible and not the received text which the reformers followed which had been the Bible of the Greek church. You see, this Bible had been in the church of the East, the received text, scriptures, as the Orthodox church to this day largely still keeps. The Armenian church, the Syrian church, all of those churches had the received text. The Valdensians used the received text. But the Vulgate had many strange things which uh, helped the Rome uh, underscore some of their doctrines. So that's the first thing they did. It's the Vulgate that is the one we use and not the received text. And the true churches of the West through the centuries, they all kept the received text. Second point was tradition was of equal authority with the sacred scriptures. 
The third point, the five disputed books found in the Catholic Bible but rejected by Protestant scholars were declared canonical. So these are the apocryphal books where you can drive out demons with the gallbladder of a fish if you want to do that. Uh, the priests only, and not the laity, were capable of rightly interpreting the scriptures. So those were the first points that they accepted, which was a re total rejection of the Reformed position. But there were still questions. Why should tradition be the norm wherein scripture is interpreted? Why should the scriptures not be the standard of righteousness and be useful for informing in terms of doctrine and morals, etc. So this argument continued. So what about the sola scriptura, the Bible and the Bible alone? This is the Catechism of the Catholic Church. And you can see the webpage there. It's the Vatican webpage directly. Sacred scripture is the speech of God as it is put down in writing under the breath of the Holy Spirit. And holy tradition transmits in its entirety the word of God. Interesting, so the word of God is in the tradition, right? Which has been entrusted to the apostles by Christ, the Lord and the Holy Spirit. So the church has this scripture in its hand now. It transmits it to the successors of the apostles so that enlightened by the spirit of truth, they may faithfully preserve, expound, and spread it abroad by their preaching. As a result, the church, to whom the transmission and interpretation of revelation is entrusted, does not derive her certainty about all revealed truth from the Holy Scriptures alone. This is Rome speaking. Both scripture and tradition must be accepted and honored with equal sentiment of devotion and reverence. The magisterium of the church, that's the hierarchy, the pope, the cardinals, the bishops. The task of giving an authentic interpretation of the word of God, whether in its written form or in the form of tradition, has been entrusted to the living teaching office of the church alone. Its authority in this matter is exercised in the name of Jesus Christ. This means that the task of interpretation has been entrusted to the bishop in communion with the successor of Peter, the bishop of Rome. So who tells you what to believe? Rome tells you what to believe. So, you know what? You can use your Bible as a doorstop. Who needs it? I grew up as a Roman Catholic. I never had a Bible. I had a catechism book. That told me what to believe. The church told me, not the Bible. Now, how did this come about now, that they entrenched this in spite of the Protestant position? This becomes very fascinating. Sunday and Sola Scriptura, this is now at the Council of Trent. Hours, weeks, months, yes, many sessions went by with this anxious question in their hearts. Then one morning, January 18, 1562, Caspar de Fossa, the Archbishop of Reggio hurried from his room and appeared before his conference to proclaim that he had the answer. Protestants, he urgently reasoned, never could defend Sunday's sacredness. If they continued to offer as their authority the Bible and the Bible only, it was clear that they had no Bible command for the first day of the week. Accordingly, According to Pallavinici, or whatever his name is there, papal champion of the council, the archbishop said, it is then evident that the church has power to change the commandments because by its power alone and not by the preaching of Jesus, it had transferred the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. Tradition, they concluded, was not antiquity but continuous inspiration. None could continue to fight the acceptance of tradition when the only authority for Sunday sacredness in the church was tradition. This discovery nerved the council to go forward in its work. Here was a challenge to the Protestant world. Protestants, said Rome, you say sola scriptura, 
then why do you keep our commandment and not the Bible's commandment? What should Protestants have done at that point? They should have gotten up and said, you know what? You're right. Scripture says, keep the Sabbath. History tells us that the Valdensians were persecuted and slaughtered because they kept the Sabbath. The Albigensians, the Celtic Church, the Church of the East, they kept the Sabbath. The church in India, they were ruthlessly persecuted. The church in Africa, they were ruthlessly persecuted. History tells us that that is the right day. We will keep it now because the Bible says so. But they lost the opportunity. They didn't do it. And so factions arose within Protestantism over time that said we should go back to the Sabbath. And then even Protestantism warred against those factions. And you had uh, the great movements, even in the time of Martin Luther, of people standing up and saying, keep the Sabbath. And then the Seventh-day Baptists started keeping the Sabbath. And then other people started keeping the Sabbath. But every time there was a lid on it, and it seemed to fade away. This is the Catholic mirror. The Protestant world has been from its infancy in the 16th century and throughout in thorough accord with the Catholic Church in keeping holy not Saturday but Sunday. The discussion of the grounds that led to this unanimity of sentiment and practice for over 300 years must help towards placing Protestantism on a solid basis in this particular. Should the arguments in favor of its position overcome those furnished by the Israelites and the Adventists. The Bible, the sole recognized teacher of both litigants, being the umpire and witness. If, however, on the other hand, the latter furnish arguments incontrovertible by the great mass of Protestants, both cases of litigants appealing to their common teacher, the Bible, the great body of Protestants so far from clamoring as they do with vigorous pertinacity for the strict keeping of Sunday have no other resource recourse left them left than the admission that they have been teaching and practicing what is scripturally false for over three centuries. By adopting the teaching and practice of what they have always pretended to believe to be an apostate church, namely Rome. Contrary to every warrant and teaching of sacred scripture to add to the intensity of the scriptural unpardonable blunder, it involves one of the most positive and emphatic commands of God to his servant man, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. This is pretty arrogant. So Rome is saying, Protestants, keep quiet. You're just naughty children. You're doing what we say anyway. You're keeping the Sunday. And the Israelites and the, the Adventists have told you, here it says in the scripture, but you choose to follow us and you claim that we are an apostate church, you're just nothing but rebellious little children, come back to us or we will sort you out, basically. Interesting. Now, isn't it interesting that in spite of this, Protestantism over the eons has absolute, absolutely rock steadily agreed that the law stands, except factions that occasionally arose that were called antinomians, that were opposed ruthlessly by Protestants. Dr. Jack Kilcrease, a junk professor of theology at the Institute for the Lutheran Theology, writes, those who reject the law, that's the antinomians, must create new laws in order to prevent people from obeying the real law of God and thereby simply establishing a new legalism, which they call antinomianism, but it's not. It's actually a new legalism. Have a third use of the law. That is their own perverse version of it. <laughs> yeah, so we have many churches today that say the law of God, the Ten Commandments, have been nailed to the cross. Well, these theologians don't think so. They actually say legalism is antinomianism, just as antinomianism is a kind of legalism. And they're right. They're right. John Calvin said, some unskillful person, from not attending to this, boldly discard the whole law of Moses. 
and do away with both its tables, imagining it unchristian to adhere to a doctrine which contains the ministration of death. Far from our thoughts be this profane notion. Let us distinguish accurately between what has been abrogated, taken away in the law, and what still remains in force when the Lord declares that he came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill. So Calvin says, the law stands. That until heaven and earth pass away, not one jot or tittle shall remain unfulfilled. He shows that this advent was not to derogate in any degree from the observance of the law. And justly, since the very end of his coming was to remedy the transgression of the law. Therefore the doctrine of the law has not been infringed by Christ, but remains. That by teaching, admonishing, rebuking, correcting, it may fit and prepare us for every good work. Calvinism agreed. The law stands. John Wesley, Methodism. The moral law contained in the Ten Commandments and enforced by the prophets he did not take away. It was not the design of his coming to revoke any part of this. This is a law which never can be broken, which stands fast as the faithful witness in heaven. This was from the beginning of the world, being written not in tables of stone, but in hearts of children of men when they came out of the hands of the Creator. So this law stood there from the beginning. And however the letters once wrote with the finger of God are now in a great measure defaced by sin, yet can they not wholly be blotted out while we have any consciousness of good and evil? Every part of this law must remain in force upon all mankind and in all ages as not depending either on time or place or any other circumstances liable to change, but on the nature of God and the nature of man and their unchangeable relation to each other. He's adamant the law stands. Now, what about Adventists? Adventists say exactly the same thing, but when they, are, when they say it, they're called sectarian. Why? Here's an Adventist source from the Desire of Ages. And since all the commandments are summed up in love to God and man, it follows that not one precept can be broken without violating this principle. Thus Christ taught his hearers that the law of God is not so many separate precepts, some of which are of great importance, while others are of small importance and may with impunity be ignored. Our Lord presents the first four and the last six commandments as a divine whole and teaches that the love of God will be shown by obedience to all his commandments. Romans 2.13, for it is not the hearers of the law that are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. So Adventism doesn't say anything different from what the Lutherans say, what the Baptists say, what the Methodists say, what the Calvinists say, but they are now weird because they say it. Does that make any sense? Here's another quote from an Adventist source. That so-called faith in Christ, which professes to release men from the obligation of obedience to God, is not faith, but presumption. By grace ye are saved through faith, but faith, if it has not works, is dead, quoting Ephesians and James. Jesus said of himself before he came to earth, I delight to do thy will, O my God, thy law is within my heart. And just before he ascended again to heaven, he declared, I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. The scripture says, Hereby do we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that says he abideth in him ought himself also to walk even as he walked, one verse after the other. Because Christ also suffered for us, leaving an example that we should follow his steps. The condition of eternal life is now just what it always has been, just what it was in paradise before the fall of our first parents. Perfect obedience to the law of God, perfect righteousness. If eternal life were granted on any other condition short of this, then the happiness of the whole universe would be imperiled. 
The way would be open for sin with all its train and woe and misery and immortalized. This is exactly what Wesley said. There's no difference. So Adventism and uh, Methodism should be on the same platform when it comes to the immutability of the law. James 1.22, But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he's like a man beholding a natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, and goes away, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoever looketh in the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Now we mustn't confuse the fact that you do it with the fact that you are being saved by it. The one is not a means, but a consequence of salvation. Galatians 3 verse 11 says, But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. There's the other side of the coin. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. And that law that he's referring to there is the ceremonial law that tells us that our solution lies in the blood of the Lamb. But the Ten Commandments, they stand. So Romans 8 verse 7 says, Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. That describes my condition. I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. My natural propensity is to do the wrong thing. And only through the Spirit of God can this propensity be kept in check. Romans 3 verse 31, do we make void the law of God through faith? Therefore don't I have to keep it? God forbid we establish the law. It's not the law that's the problem. I'm the problem. The law's not the problem. I am. All right, here's my next question then. Is our attempt at keeping the law then not legalism? Because this is what the Protestant world will say even though they say exactly the same as the Adventist world, they will say, but you're legalists. Do you know how often people have told me I'm a legalist? It's unbelievable. I hear it all the time. Legalism. I abhor a legalism. Philippians 3, 9, And be found in him not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God, by faith. And remember that Martin Luther said that these two foxes, legalism and antinomianism, are tied together by the tails? Even though their heads look in opposite directions while they outwardly profess to be great enemies? Inwardly, they think, teach, and defend one and the same thing against our one and only Savior, Christ, who alone is our righteousness. So the church has always been vacillating between either legalism or antinomianism. And remember Luther said it's like a drunk peasant riding a donkey and he either falls into the ditch of legalism or he falls into the ditch of antinomianism. This war has been raging from the very beginning. Abel gave the perfect offering by faith in the promise of the lamb that was to come. Cain said, I'm not doing that. Heal the works of my hands. Be satisfied with that. And his offering was not accepted. And when he saw that the one by faith had been accepted, accepted he clobbered him to death. It's always been like that. And so we have this conflict in the church since the very beginning. Now, this is uh, what I believe. This is what I wrote. Legalism lowers the standard of God's law to the level of your own capability. So if you want to be a legalist, you will have strict laws of what you may do and may not do on a particular day or in your life in general. And you will have uh, control freak rules telling you how you should live. 
and only up to that standard which you can endure, then you're a perfect legalist. While antinomianism not only turns all sanctification into justification, but then creates its own law to compensate for the absence of God's law, thus making antinomianism nothing other than legalism. So the antinomians are all clamoring for Sunday keeping. And they say, why are you not keeping Sunday? I will force you to keep Sunday. Aren't they then enforcing their own law? They're then not enforcing God's law, so they're actually legalists, although they call themselves antinomianists. Here's a quote from the book Faith and Works. It's an Adventist source. If man cannot, by any of his good works, merit salvation, then it must be holy of grace. Received by man as a sinner because he receives and believes in Jesus. It is wholly a free gift. Justification by faith is placed beyond controversy and all this controversy is ended as soon as the matter is settled that the merits of fallen man in his good works can never procure eternal life for him. That's the Adventist position. Is there one ounce of legalism in that statement, yes or no? Yes. Nothing. Not one ounce. Does that mean that we do not have legalists in our ranks? Of course not. I don't think there's a denomination in the world that doesn't have legalists in its ranks. And they're just drunk peasants that have fallen off the one side of the donkey. So go and help them and say, excuse me, can I help you out of your drunken stupor and get you back onto the donkey? That's what you're supposed to do to a legalist. And if he says, but you're saying I don't have to keep a law, well, then he's fallen into the other ditch. Then I say, okay, can I help you out of this ditch? Get back on your donkey. Simul justice et peccator. This was Martin Luther's favorite phrase, and I love it. Simul justice et peccator. Dr. R.C. Sproul shares the very heart of the gospel as he explains Martin Luther's Latin phrase, simul justice et peccator, which simply means simultaneously just, simultaneously a sinner. That's a contradiction in terms if you look at it, but he explains it. And so with this formula, Luther was saying, in our justification, we are one and the same time righteous or just and sinners. Now, if he would say that we are at the same time and in the same relationship just and sinners, that would be a contradiction in terms. Because you can't be both, right? But that's not what he was saying. He was saying from one perspective, in one sense, we are just. In another sense, from a different perspective, we are sinners. And how he defines that is simple. In and of ourselves, under the analysis of God's scrutiny, we still have sin. We are still sinners, but by imputation, by faith in Jesus Christ, whose righteousness is now transferred to our account, then we are considered just or righteous. This is the very heart of the gospel. So here is poor, miserable, sinfully inclined me. And I have this nature. And I say, who will save me from this body of death? And I say, I don't want to be like this, but I am like this. And God says, seeing that you repent and don't want to be like that, that is the wish of your heart, but your flesh has a different tendency, I will cover you with my righteousness and you're 100% just before God. But you're still struggling with these tendencies. You see, people love magic wand Christianity. You go into the waters of baptism, you come out holy, perfect, <laughs> undefiled for the rest of your existence. It's not a reality. Ask anyone. The first time you walk 
with your head up in the nose, you'll fall and slip on a banana peel and realize that you're not capable of standing with your nose in the air. It doesn't work. So this is what Martin Luther said. Simul justice et peccato. I'm declared just in Christ, but I still have these attributes. Now, Seventh-day Adventism that are being decried as legalists, how do they see it? Here is another very famous Adventist source. So long as Satan reigns, and I address that in all, how shall I say this, all possible kindness that I can conjure up in my miserable human being, even to our own legalists. Let me read you this statement. So long as Satan reigns, we shall have self to subdue. Besetting sins to overcome, so long as life shall last, there will be no stopping place, no point which we can reach and say, I have fully attained. Their legalism disappears. Sanctification is the result of a lifelong obedience. Constant war against the carnal mind must be maintained. And we must be aided by the refining influence of the grace of God, which will attract the mind upward and habituate it to meditate upon pure and holy things. In other words, I must say, Lord, I don't want to be like that. If I've brought my wife to tears for the five millionth time in my life, and I think about myself, and I say, Lord, I don't want to be like that. But I'll probably do it for the five millionth and one time. But I don't want to be like that. And it subdues. And that temper that you had can be subdued. But under certain circumstances, that miserable you might just rise again from the dead. And so Paul says, take a hammer and slam him to death again. I die, how often does he say? Daily. daily. This is a daily battle. You cannot for one day get up and say, well, today I feel perfect. <laughs> <laughs> You'll find out just how perfect you are. Here's another one. Advent is source. I'm, I'm saying this to my Protestant brethren. Please reconsider whether we are legalists or not. We may create an unreal world in our own mind or picture an ideal church where the temptations of Satan no longer prompt to evil. But perfection exists only in our imagination. That's pretty straightforward, isn't it? So when people say to you, you have to become perfect, then you must realize that person has a wonderful imagination. When human beings receive holy flesh, they will not remain on earth, but will be taken to heaven. So that's when the total transformation takes place, and when you discard this propensity. Now, please don't misunderstand. Your propensity is not a license to sin. It's not right to have bursts of temper. It's not right to do things that are contrary to kindness and the principles of love. Love is gentle, love is kind, love is long-suffering, it has no record of wrong, all of those issues. You must meditate on these things and you must say to Christ, here, this heart of mine is miserable, will you please come in and sort this mess out? I can't. Please do it for me. When human beings receive holy flesh, they will not remain on earth, but will be taken to heaven. While sin is forgiven in this life, its results are not wholly removed. It is at his coming that Christ is to change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. Just because there are legalists in our ranks doesn't make the doctrine of this church legalistic. But it is biblical. Simul justice et peccator, three selected messages, another one. But we shall not boast of our holiness as we have clearer views of Christ's spotlessness and infinite purity, we shall feel as Daniel when he beheld the glory of the Lord and said, my comeliness was turned into 
in me into corruption. I didn't look so fancy anymore when I looked into the face of the Son of God. We cannot say I am sinless. Until when? Till this vile body is changed and fashioned like unto his glorious body. There is no such thing as perfection this side of eternity. There is such a thing as total dependence this side of eternity. But we can't, if we constantly seek to follow Jesus, the blessed hope is ours of standing before, before the throne without spot or wrinkle. In whose righteousness? In his. Or any such thing, complete in Christ, robed in his righteousness and perfection. Please, Protestant world, get it out of your mind that Adventism means legalism. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the chief, says Paul to Timothy. Well, I think they're preparing a boxing ring up there. And when we get to heaven, I'm going to challenge Paul to a boxing match. And if I win, then I will take that title. Because who is he to say that he is the chief sinner when I think I am? So how does the Sabbath relate now to redemption? Because this is now an important issue. We know that it relates to creation. And God said, it is finished. I had no contribution to make to the creation. How about redemption? Deuteronomy chapter 5 has the second table, as, or the first table as it was rewritten. And the Sabbath is written slightly different. Keep the Sabbath day to sanctify it as the Lord thy God has commanded thee. And then comes the Sabbath commandment of what you may do. And then the reason is changed. It says, and remember that thou was a servant in the land of Egypt, and that the Lord God brought thee out thence through a mighty hand and by a stretched out arm. Therefore the Lord thy God commanded thee to keep the Sabbath day. So here, the reason for keeping the Sabbath day is a redemptive reason. I took you out of slavery and I set you free. That was Moses, who did it in the typical and in the physical realm. Christ, in turn, takes you out of another slavery, out of the slavery of sin, and sets you free in him. So we are his by creation and by redemption. Hebrews tells us that quite plainly. Hebrews chapter 1. God, who at sundry times and diverse manners spoke in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, as in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom he also made the worlds. So it's quite clear that Jesus is the creator who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power, so he's also the maintainer of this creation, when he had by himself purged our sins. So what contribution did I make to the purging of my sins? None. None. It says here, he had by himself purged our sins. This is scripture. Sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. So I had no contribution when it came to the creation, and I had zero contribution when it came to redemption. Nothing. After all, I was dead. Dead in transgression. And only when Christ died for me and paid the price and asked me to die to self and to be resurrected in him so that not I live, but he lives in me, then I received life. A dead person cannot resurrect himself unless he is God and has life within himself. So what contribution did I present from death to life? None. He did it all. Now here's my question. If the Sabbath, 
commemorates creation in which I had zero part. And the Sabbath is the memorial of redemption in which I had zero part. Then how, by keeping it, is it legalism? It's impossible. So by keeping it, it is an acknowledgement that I had nothing to do with my creation, that I had nothing to do with my redemption, and that the life that I live is by faith in the Son of God. Therefore, keeping the Sabbath is the ultimate symbol of righteousness by faith. It's not legalism. Whereas if I say, no, I will change this day to another day and command you to keep the other day, then it's what? Then it's legalism. It's actually antinomianism because you've taken away the law, but you've replaced it with your own law, which is not God's law, so it's legalism. So keeping Sunday is legalism, but keeping Sabbath is righteousness by faith. That must confuse the Protestant world, right? <laughs> I hope so. Now, this is Jesus in his triumphant entry. And he's coming into Jerusalem. And for the first time, he allows himself to be publicly honored as the Messiah. All previous times, when people said, you are the Messiah, the Son of God, what did he tell the people? Shh, don't tell anybody. My time has not yet come. But here when he did it, the Pharisees came when they cheered and they said, silence, make your disciples silent. Keep them quiet. What did he say? If they don't cry out, the very stones will cry out because his moment had come. Now this is, this is fascinating to me. This is a brilliant story. This is the last week. His triumphant entry is on the Sunday, first day of the week. And then there are six messianic days. He's now been acknowledged as your king arriving on a donkey, the cult of a donkey. Here he is, acknowledged as the Messiah, the messianic week. This is the week of redemption, six days. And on the sixth day, he was crucified. Before sunset, he was in the grave. The Sabbath, he rested. He did not see corruption, just like the manna did not see corruption from the Friday through to the Sunday. And on the first day, he arose to take up his priestly duty. He got up to work, not to rest. But he rested on which day? On the Sabbath day. So this is the antithesis of the creation week because the restoration and the recreation is even a greater work than the creation because the creation didn't cost the life of the Son of God, but the recreation cost the life of the Son of God. Martin Luther says, the God that didn't die for me, I will not accept. If Jesus is not God, then I am still dead then I cannot exist. So here he arrives, and uh, I've written this. I've tried to be poetic. I'm not very good at it, but I wrote it anyway. And I'll read it to you, because I want people to, to understand what I'm trying to say, and I want to put it in writing. The triumphant entry signaled the final week of redemption. For the first time, Jesus permitted the people to hallow him as their Messiah and King. They spread palm branches and sang hosannas as their king rode on a donkey, the cult of a donkey. His subsequent cruel crowning in that same week, imagine this, in the same week, his subsequent cruel crowning as king was a mock coronation. Jesus humbly endured this mockery and wore the crown of thorns with a dignity as no earthly monarch had ever worn a glistening coronet. 
a mock scepter in his hand and a robe of purple as a covering, they as verily crowned him king as they intended to deny him. Through his stripes we are healed before the throne a cross, before life, death, before the resurrection, a burial. This sums up this final redemptive week, the greatest week in the history of the universe, where the God of the universe gives up his life to redeem his creation and set the record straight once and for all as to the character of God and lay in the dust the accusations of Satan that he is not just and not merciful. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, which he refused because it was a sedative, he didn't even take the sedative to take away his pain. He endured it in its entirety. He said, it is finished. Where did he say that before? Creation week. He said, it is finished. And here he said, it is finished. Finished means finished. Did you know that? <laughs> finished means it is finished. It's a completed work. I have nothing to add to it. I can take nothing away from it. It is finished. And he rested on the Sabbath day. And anyone who chooses to acknowledge him by resting on that day acknowledges a completed work. That's righteousness by faith. So the Sabbath is a symbol of sanctification. Why? Because it is a public acknowledgement of his authority in my life and my realization that I cannot sanctify myself. No matter what I do, no matter how good I try to be or how pleasant my smile is, I cannot sanctify myself. And by keeping the Sabbath, I'm saying, you sanctify me. Because he said, I am the Lord that sanctify me. Therefore, keep my Sabbath day. So, how do I tell the world I'm a good Christian? Put a cross around my neck, right? How do I tell them I'm a better Christian than the other Christian? I put a bigger cross around my neck or a more expensive one, right? I'm not being facetious. I'm just trying to point out an issue here. What if I make three or four pilgrimages a year and save all my money and do that? Or what if I take all my money and I give it to the poor? Or what if I do this or I do that or I do the other? What will people say? They will look at me and say, hmm, good fellow, look at him, he gave his money to the poor, wonderful, let's put him in the newspaper. Let's put him on the television, let's give him a reward so that he doesn't have to have a reward in heaven. Because the Bible says what you do in secret, your Father in heaven will take note of and will reward publicly. But if you think that you can stand there and look great, then you've already had your reward. You've had all the accolades that you will get. That's what the Bible teaches, doesn't it? Yes. So how do I tell the world, I believe that Jesus Christ is my creator, and I believe beyond the shadow of a doubt that he is my redeemer, and he is my righteousness, and he is my sanctifier. What do I do? The Keep the Sabbath. And what happens? All hell breaks loose. <laughs> That's what happens. That's exactly what happens. Now the Hebrews could not conquer Canaan by themselves, so neither can we. We cannot conquer the gates of heaven and say, let me in, I've conquered. Ezekiel 20 verse 12, More also I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them that they may know that I am the Lord that sanctified them. Hebrews 13 verse 12, Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will. Working in you 
that which is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever and ever. Amen. Well, isn't this perfectionism? You have to be perfect? Yes. Who's, who's doing the work there? Jesus is doing the work. So the motive will be different because he's doing the work. It's not you doing the work. It's not you being perfect. You are pathetic. If you had to do it, your motive would be wrong. So if your motive is right, it's not from you, it's from him. So you have nothing to boast about, right? That's how it works. So your perfection is only in him. And yes, you are perfect. God looks at you and says, my perfect child, look what you've done. Actually, you've been pathetic, but he's been great. John 6, 28, then said they unto him, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? Here's the question. How do I do it? Jesus answered and said to him, this is the work of God, that you believe on him whom he has sent. Why do we not get it? That our perfection is only in him and never in us. Why don't we understand that? Because we don't want to. We want to contribute. I don't want it for nothing. I want to pay for it. So the Sabbath is a memorial. Revelation eleven nineteen, And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in the temple the ark of his testament, and there was lightning and voices and thunderings and earthquake and great hail. So there is tremendous glory in this law of God. And to look at it made, well, Moses, when he came down from the mount, his face was shining, and the Israelites said, cover your face, I don't want to see it. So Jesus, the Jews, and the Sabbath. Now it gets interesting, because now we have a conflict. Because everybody says if you keep the Sabbath, you're, you're keeping the Jewish Sabbath. You're like the Jews. The Jews were actually obsessed with Sabbath observance. Why? Because they'd gone into Babylonian captivity for breaking the Sabbath. And here's the verse, Ezekiel 20, 23. I lifted up mine hand unto them also in the wilderness, that I would scatter them amongst the heathen and disperse them through the countries, because they had not executed my judgment, but had despised my statutes, had polluted my Sabbaths, and their eyes were after their father's idols. So you went into captivity, you were Sabbath breakers. So after the Babylonian captivity, the Jews became very strict and ritualistic in their Sabbath observance as shown in their oral law, which contained over 2,000 commands on how to keep the Sabbath day. You were not allowed to eat an egg that was laid on a Sabbath day. There were all kinds of pathetic rules as to rituals and washings and what you had to do on the Sabbath day and everybody's eye was upon his brother to see whether he adhered to the principle. It became a bondage. That doesn't mean the Sabbath has to be taken away. That means the bigotry has to be taken away. So this was their big issue. John 5, 17, but Jesus answered them, my father works hitherto, and I work. If I didn't work on the Sabbath day, said Jesus, you'd be dead because you'd stop breathing. In fact, Jesus performed seven Sabbath miracles and thereby destroyed the ritualistic views of the Sabbath. Why seven? Isn't that an interesting number? Mark 7 verse 9. And he said unto them, Full well you reject the commandments of God that you may keep your own traditions. True representation of Sabbath keeping is a relationship. It has nothing to do with how you perform your little duties. There are hardly any laws in the Bible as to how to keep the Sabbath. Do not do your own thing. Do not do your business. Do not neglect the assembly of the saints. Uh, call the Sabbath a delight. And then you, you run out of rules. That's it. Because it's a relationship. So Jesus heals a lame man by the pool of Bethesda. 
This is very fascinating because it applies to today. Rise, take up your bed and walk. These three commands were forbidden by the Jews on the Sabbath day. So when Jesus did that, they freaked. After this, there was a feast of the Jews. This is the healing. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Interesting, you always go up to Jerusalem. You go down to anywhere else. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. Four, five is the number of humanity. You have five senses, and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then went first after the troubling of the water stepped in and was made whole of whatever disease he had. And a certain man was there which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. That's almost the whole generation. When Jesus saw him lie, and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he said unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man. And thereby he summed up the condition of the Jewish church. Thirty-eight years lying there, waiting for a stupid doctrine to be fulfilled that an angel would come and twirl the water, because that's what he had been told, when it was probably a thermal movement of the water, and only the strongest gets in first. So God is real kind. Tough guy, you get in there, they believe that person would be healed. We have it in the churches today. People coming and walking through that water, throwing about their, away their crutches, shouting they are healed, and tomorrow they pick up the crutches and are much worse off than before because they had to walk for two seconds without them. So here this man lies and he says, I have no man. And I believe that's the condition of the church. Our church is in such a poor state. We have lost this contact to God. We are expecting rituals and miracles and strange occurrences. I'm sure Jesus' back was to the pool when he looked at the man. And he said, when the water is troubled, there's no one to put me into the pool because when I get there, somebody else is there first. And Jesus said to him, why do you believe that rubbish? Look at me. Stand up. Pick up your bed. Walk. And he destroyed a whole religious system. And the man stood up and immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked, and the same day was the Sabbath. And the Jews therefore said unto him that was cured, It is the Sabbath day, it is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. He answered, He that made me whole. The same said unto me, Take up thy bed and walk. Because where does it say in the Bible, Thou shalt not pick up thy bed and walk on the Sabbath day? It doesn't say that. <laughs> then asked they him, What man is that which said unto thee, Take up thy bed and walk? And he said, that was healed, wist not who it was. For Jesus had conveyed himself away, a multitude being in that place. And then afterwards, Jesus finds him at the temple. And he says to him, behold, thou art made whole, sin no more. Now, let's think about this word sin. We know that sin, sin is transgression of the law. That's the main definition in the Bible. But the sin is also that they believe not on me, said Jesus. Righteousness by faith. Lest worse things come upon thee. The man departed and he told the Jews it was Jesus who made him whole. And therefore they persecuted Jesus because he had done this thing on the Sabbath day. And Jesus says, my father works hitherto and I work. You won't tell me what entails work. I'm the creator and I just proved it to you. And you still don't want to believe it? Your Sabbath keeping is an abomination, not because of the day, but because of the way in which you keep it. So then Jesus healed an unclean spirit. And they went to Capernaum straight on the Sabbath day. He entered into the synagogue. And he taught with authority, says the Bible. And there was a man with an unclean spirit. 
And he cried out, Let us alone, O Jesus of Nazareth. And I believe there are many people with unclean spirits in the world today. People are suffering. Depression is at the highest level ever in humanity. There must be clouds of demons depressing humanity. And the way to free yourself from that bondage is to look up and not to look around you and hope for help from man. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace and come out of him. And the unclean spirit came out. And they said, What doctrine is this? What authority commands even the unclean spirits? Now you can turn that into a charade and start commanding unclean spirits. When you accept Jesus into your life, is there room for an unclean spirit? When he knocks and says, can I come in? And you open the door and you say, I know that it's pretty messy in there. I haven't tidied it up at all. And I don't know how. And he says, it's okay, I'll do it for you. Is it okay? I say, please come in. Is there room for a demon in there? No. no. Does that mean a demon won't oppress you? Didn't the demons oppress Jesus? Didn't demons oppress the disciples? Yes, you won't have an easy life but at least you won't have them in you. Jesus heals many on the Sabbath day. Well, he went with Simon and Andrew and James and John, and there was Simon's wife, and she was sick, and he touched her, and he healed her, and immediately the fever left her. And then he healed many who were sick in diverse diseases. And the more he did this, the more irate the Jews became. And then he healed the man with a withered hand. And again he entered into the, the synagogue. And again it was the Sabbath day. And they watched him. Was he going to do it? Was he not going to do it? And there was this man with a withered hand. I believe there are many people in our churches whose hands have become withered. Spiritually withered. They have no strength to do anything anymore. What you need is you need this helping hand. And he said... To the man with the withered hand, stand forth. And he said unto them, Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath day? Can you see the issue? Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath day? Or to do evil, to save life, or to kill? So can you do good on the Sabbath day? Even if it seems to be breaking the Sabbath day? Of course. Keeping the Sabbath has not to do with ritual. Keeping the Sabbath has to do with motive. And when he had looked around about them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts, he said unto the man, Stretch forth thine hand. And what did they do? They took counsel with the Herodians against him so that they could destroy him. Now the Jews hated the Herodians because Herod was the king. But Herod was a sin, so he was a descendant of Esau, and he'd been converted to Judaism, but he, was, he wasn't pure blood. He wasn't of the right kind. So they didn't like each other. But when they found a common enemy, and that common enemy was Jesus, then state and church combined to persecute him. Do you think it could happen again? Oh, yes. And it happened in connection with the Sabbath day. Do you think the typology can tell us that something like this can happen again and that the church and the state can come together and say, these people are not honoring the command of unity, the mark of solidarity. They are fundamentalists. Do you think it could happen? Sure it could happen. And then this famous story of Jesus healing a man born blind. What a magnificent story. I'm not going to read it all. But there he is, and there is this man born blind. And Jesus takes some soil, some clay, and he spits on it, and he makes a paste, and he puts it on his eyes. That's the act. When did he take some clay in the past? Creation. At creation, he took some clay and he manufactured the whole man. 
But now he takes it and he puts it on his eyes. But he expects something. He expects an act of faith. And he says, go and wash. And the man could have said, you know, this guy's crazy. He spits mud on my face and then says, go and wash. But he does it. An act of faith. And suddenly he can see. He was born blind. And of course, he's, he's out of his skin. And they take him to the Pharisees. And the Pharisees look at him. And they say, who did this? <laughs> How was I? No, I couldn't see him. I was blind. <laughs> In any case, this ritual carries on. Jesus later meets him, and he falls at the feet of Jesus, and he acknowledges him as the Messiah, and he worships him. But in this discussion with the Pharisees, they say, well, if it is this Jesus fellow, he's a sinner because he doesn't keep the Sabbath day because this was on the Sabbath day. So the man says, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. But one thing I do know, I was blind, and now I see and so they question him, and he says, I told you already, do you want to become his disciples too? <laughs> so they freak, and they call his parents, and they say, is this your son? And they say, yes, that's, that's our son. And they say, well, how, was he like this before? They said, no, he was blind. Well, how come he can see that? So they're scared of the Pharisees, you know. They've got fancy hats on, and they look great, and they've got nice robes on, you know. It's pretty scary, these guys. And they say to him, ask him, he's of age. And then they kick him out. And that's when Jesus picks him up. Beautiful story. This is their last chance. They've been confronted with creator capacity. Since the beginning of the world, said the man, it is unheard of that someone who is born blind should be made to see. This can only be the creator God. And he acknowledges him as the creator God and he falls at his feet and he worships him and the others reject it. Isn't it interesting that he did it on the Sabbath day to set this man free? So this is the whole story. We're not going to read it all again. And it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. And then there is a woman with a disabling spirit. And he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bound down altogether and could in no wise lift herself up. And when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said unto her, Woman, thou art loosed from this infirmity. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight. And the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation, because that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath day, and said unto the people, These are, There are six days in which men ought to work. In them therefore come and be healed, and not on the Sabbath day. And Jesus rebuked him so beautifully. And the Lord answered him and said, Thou hypocrite. Does not each one of you on the Sabbath day lose his ox or his ass from the store and lead him away to watering? And ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound, lo, these 18 years be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? And when he said these things, all his adversaries were ashamed. And they glorified God, but they went away angry. Now, a woman is also a symbol of a church. I wonder how many churches are bowed over with infirmity because they've lost the divine connection, the relationship. Are we here to keep pews warm or are we here to have a relationship with God? Or what about the man with the dropsy, with the puffy little hands and the swollen face? This man had a heart condition. And he healed him on the Sabbath day, and again they were infuriated because they, they, he did this. I wonder how many people in this world today have a serious spiritual heart condition. I believe the whole world is suffering from a serious 
spiritual heart condition. Who can heal that? And what better day to be healed than on the day of rest when you acknowledge that He is your Creator, He is your Redeemer, He is your righteousness, He is your sanctification, He is your hope for a better future. Will that not uplift any burdened heart? That you don't have to struggle with your own patheticness in order to get there? Harden not your heart, says in the provocation in the day of the temptation, says Paul in the book of Hebrews. When your fathers tempted me and proved me and saw my works 40 years, wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said, they do always err in their hearts and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. What deprives you of rest? Departing from the living God. That deprives you of rest. If you want to find rest, then find rest in believing the Word. And believing the Word, faith without works is dead. Means doing what the Word says. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. Then you are a partaker. The righteous man falls many times. But he gets up again. And the Lord picks him up. There are many times in my life, in my Christian walk, I've been a Christian now for 30 years, where I've said, Lord, I'm sure that now I'm struck from your book of life. And I was so miserable. <coughs> and my conscience rebuked me, and I realized my conscience is rebuking me, therefore I have not yet been rejected. He's still talking to me. Thanks be to God. Let me start again. And I start all over again. Luke 23, 44, and it was about the sixth hour. Now take note. And there was darkness over the earth until the ninth hour. So that was three o'clock. Jesus is on the cross. It's Friday. It now gives you the hours. And the sun was darkened and the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thine hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. Now when the centurion saw what was done, he glorified God, saying, Certainly this was a righteous man. And that day was the preparation and the Sabbath drew on. So three o'clock, Jesus died. It's still the Sabbath the day before the Sabbath, it's the Friday. The sun is soon to set. This word, the preparation, is the day used only for the day before the seventh day Sabbath. So it's Friday. What happened then? Well, they went and prepared the spices and did everything. They only had a very short time. They couldn't complete the work because the Sabbath was coming. Now the next day that followed the day of the preparation... Please note. The chief priests and the Pharisees came together unto Pilate. Uh, excuse me, uh, what day was that? Sabbath. That was the Sabbath day. Do you know that the Jew regarded the Gentile as unclean? So they wouldn't go into Pilate. They would stand outside and say, Hello, Pilate, Pilate, come out, because, you know, they didn't want to be defiled by him. So the chief priests and the Pharisees came together unto Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember that that deceiver said that while he was yet alive, after three days I will rise again. Command, therefore, that the sepulcher be made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say unto the people, He is risen from the dead, so the last error shall be worse than the first. Pilate said unto them, You have a watch. Go your way. Make it sure as you can. I won't do it. 
I'm a, I've had enough of you people. You've caused enough trouble. I'm not going to do it. You do it. What did they do? So they went and made the sepulchre sure. What did they do? They broke the Sabbath day. Isn't it fascinating that those people who are so intent on being legalistic about something are the first ones to break the day? So here they did exactly what they crucified him for, they did themselves. They are guilty of breaking the Sabbath. Jesus never broke the Sabbath. And they set a watch. Now history is so fascinating. And I, I, I was been studying this for a while and I thought, should I share this? Should I not share it? They'll say I'm insane. But they say I'm insane anyway, so what difference does it make, right? AD 70, Titus destroys Jerusalem. Now, I was wondering, what happened in, this, in the typology of uh, the destructions that took place in the past? And what will happen, perhaps, in the future? They went into captivity because of the Sabbath, but they also plotted to kill Jesus because of his alleged Sabbath breaking. Yet they broke the Sabbath to justify their deed. That's what they did. Now, Jerusalem was destroyed in AD 70, and archaeologists have discovered the remains of an ancient tower thought to have once stood atop Jerusalem's fabled third wall, breached during the Roman Emperor Titus' siege of the city 2,000 years ago. Okay, interesting. So this is all history. So let's just go back a bit in history, and let's have a look at judgment. When the walls of Jericho fell, it was a symbol of taking Canaan. And the typology is that we also one day will inherit Canaan by the power of God. Now what happened there? Joshua 6 verse 3. And you shall compilt the city, this is Jericho, all ye men of war, and go around about the city once. Thus shalt thou do six days. And seven priests shall bear before the ark seven trumpets of ram's horns, and the seventh day you shall compass the city seven times, and the priests shall blow with the trumpet. Now it doesn't say which day it is, but if they had to do this seven days, then one of the days must have been the Sabbath, right? So wasn't that work? Marching around Jericho, marching around Jericho. Now, personally, I believe, because it says here, and the seventh day you shall compass the city seven times, that that was the Sabbath day. It's my personal belief. It's not a law of Medes and Persians, and if you don't want to accept it, that's fine. But there's no reason why I shouldn't, because it doesn't say anyway that it wasn't. All right, so let's assume that it was the Sabbath day. They worked seven times harder then on the seventh day than on any other day, right? Okay. But it was God's work. It wasn't their work. And Jesus said, I work and my Father works. And if I tell you to do something on the Sabbath day, then you're not breaking the law. And Joshua, the son of Nun, called the priests and said unto them, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Ark of the Lord. And it came to pass on the seventh day that they rose early about the dawning of the day, very early, and compassed the city after the same manner seven times. Only on that day they compassed the city seven times. And it came to pass at the seventh time when the priests blew with a trumpet Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. So on what day did they conquer Jericho? Sabbath day. That's rather strange. There were some that were actually saved. But Joshua had said unto the two men that had spied out the country, Go into the harlot's house. 
and bring out thence the woman and all that she has, as she swear unto you. And the young men that were spies went in and brought out Rahab and her father and her mother and her brethren and all that she had. Do you think uh, the Sabbath day could actually lead to regeneration of a woman, a church? Is it possible? Okay. And they brought out all her kindred and left them without the camp of Israel. And they burnt the city with fire and all that was therein. Only the silver and the gold and the vessels of brass they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. And Joshua saved Rahab the harlot alive and her father's household. Now <laughs> I find it fascinating that there is a harlot at the end of time and she is the mother of harlots. And she's going to be destroyed. Do you think some of those harlots could be plucked off the wall of Jericho? I hope so. A wall stands for commandments, for protection. Maybe they will realize it and take protection in the wall and say, hello, me too. Who knows? And Joshua saved Rahab, the harlot alive, and her father's household, and all that she had. And she dwelleth in Israel even unto this day, because she hid the messengers which Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. Now if you look at the, the genealogy, and Salmon begat Boaz of Rahab. And Boaz begat Obed of Ruth. And Obed begat Jesse, and he begat David, and then you go down the line to Jesus. So here is a harlot in the line and the genealogy of Christ, and there's a Moabitess, where God said, no Moabite shall ever enter. God is a redeemer of all. He doesn't want anyone to be lost. Revelation 14, 9 has a terrible warning. The third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast, the reformers said Catholicism, and his image. What is his image? Well, the Bible describes the image quite clearly, and it's a complete another lecture, and you can get it on a DVD or watch it on YouTube. But the image is church and state coming together, Protestantism and the civil authorities forming an image, becoming like the first one was, a persecuting power. So if you buckle under to them and receive his mark, which they claimed was Sunday keeping, in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. N no mixture of what? Of mercy. So the Sabbath is a symbol of righteousness by faith, which appropriates mercy. If you reject it, then you do not qualify for the mercy. If you do it knowingly, because fortunately the Bible also says the time of ignorance God winks at. So nobody receives the mark if they do not know about these things, but if you study it and you understand it, then you have to start making choices. And this will be the terrible curse that will come upon those, the fire and the brimstone, the final destruction. Now, is the world moving in that direction? Yes or no? Let's ask the world. If you have the right to work, you have the right to rest, the Pope says. So he says, the dignity of workers was the center of an address by Pope Francis during which the pontiff reflected on the connection between the right to employment and the right to leisure. So he's calling for legislation. And he has said on numerous times that Sunday should be the day of rest and it should be enforced. So the European Sunday Alliance in 2017 says European Day for a Work-Free Sunday call for action. Sunday's special and essential pillar of the European social model. 
However, the latest European working conditions indicates that more and more EU citizens have to work on this day. The European Sunday Alliance therefore launches today on the European Day of a Work-Free Sunday a call to action to show the need for a common EU-wide regulation. Do they want a law enacting Sunday? Yes, they do. Here's another web page, Archbishop Romero Centenary. European Day of Work-Free Sunday, call for action. We want laws. Trump seeks to take wrecking ball to division between church and state. Church and state coming together, that would be an image of what Rome did. Church and state working together to persecute anyone who contradicted her doctrines. We're living in a very interesting time. It seems as if the Archbishop or the Cardinal of New York, who happens to be the head knight of Malta in the United States always, is on very friendly foot with Donald Trump. He also, of course, did the opening prayer in his inauguration as president. EU bishop backs pillar of social rights calls for recognition of Sunday rest. This was in November 2016. It's time to introduce Sunday legislation. The bishops added the economic and financial crisis has shaken the firm belief of Europe growing together. It has showed that without cooperation and dialogue at EU and global level, the nation state alone is no longer able to address the pressing social and economic challenge of our society. We want Sunday rules. More than half a million signatures in support of Polish draft law on limitation of commerce on Sunday. One nation after the other. Switzerland, one of the most secular states in the world, Churches defend Sunday rest. The working community of Swiss churches is calling for Sunday rest, which it believes is increasingly under threat. A new bill to make Sunday a day off in Israel? The Jews are going to keep Sunday? And so recently they just relaxed their commerce laws. They again allowed public transport to proceed on a Sabbath day, which was forbidden until very recently. And now in Tel Aviv and other places, the stores may open on the Sabbath day. Even the Jews. Fascinating. Now, here's another little interesting twist of history. When I thought about Jericho, having fallen maybe even on the Sabbath day, or possibly on the Sabbath day, or probably on the Sabbath day, whichever one of those you want to choose. <laughs> Is it possible that the others also came on the Sabbath day because the Sabbath was such an important issue? So I started a little bit of research. 1312 BC, the, 12, the 10 spies brought the bad news leading to the wilderness wandering. Now, according to the Jewish writings, that happened in the month of Av, on the ninth day of the month of Av. Doesn't tell me what day it was. It just tells me that it happened on the ninth of Av. Now, the ninth of Av can fall on any day, but occasionally it falls on the seventh day. So I don't know whether that was a Sabbath day or not. It's interesting that in the year 586 BC, when the Babylonians destroyed Solomon's temple, it was on the 9th of Av. That's fascinating. I also cannot figure out on what day it was. I cannot find a historic record. It could have been on the Sabbath. But when it comes to the destruction of Jerusalem 70 AD that Jesus had predicted, that no stone would be left on one or the other, it happened to occur on the 9th of Av. That's getting a little bit coincidental right now. So, and there's historic evidence of what day it was. Let's look at that. 
The Romans destroyed the second temple. See also Daniel 70 weeks. Of 9, 135 AD, the Bar Koshba revolt was crushed by the Roman Emperor Hadrian. I referred to that earlier in my lecture, remember? That also happened on 9th of Av. So Av 9, I think every Jew is shaking in his boots. <laughs> What's coming on the 9th of Av? The city of Petra, the Jews' last stand against the Romans, was captured and liquidated, and over 100,000 Jews were slaughtered. That's when the Church of Rome switched, to, switched from the Sabbath to the Sunday and has eventually forced the entire world to adopt that day. Through the sword, by the way. Now here is a web page. It's the Temple Institute, and it's uh, a Jewish document. And it says the following. Now, a lot of this is probably myth. I'm only interested in the history and the days. Even in the last minutes of the war, this is now in 70 AD, the priests continued carrying out their sacred duties in spite of the fact that the temple courtyards flowed with the blood of the slain and fire roared at the entrances. The scope of the tragedy is recorded in the words of the rabbis. Quote, The day the temple was destroyed was the ninth of Av. It was the conclusion of the Sabbath, so the Sabbath end drew near. It was not, the Sabbath wasn't over. The ninth of Av was a Sabbath day. And the end of the seven year cycle, it was during the time of the priestly shift. So as the Sabbath was coming to an end. So the Romans were battering against the wall on the Sabbath day. That whole day, the Roman army tried to enter. The priests and Levites stood on the platform and continued to sing and did not cease until the enemy entered and subdued them. When the high priest saw that the holy temple was in flames, he climbed up on the roof of the sanctuary together with a group of young priests. Whether this is true or not, I don't know. They held the keys to the temple in their hands and spoke before the Holy One, Blessed be he, Master of the universe, it appears that we are not worthy of being trusted officers for you. Take back the keys to your house. And with that, they threw the keys upwards. The image of a hand appeared and heaven, out of he in heaven and took them. I'm not sure whether that is true. I doubt whether I want to believe it. But it's Jewish folklore. And when the priests and Levites saw that the holy temple was indeed consumed with flames, they held the lyres and trumpets and plunged into the fire. So that is what tradition says. But what is interesting, they refused to acknowledge the essence of the Sabbath day. And they suffered the consequences on the Sabbath day. Isn't that interesting? I'm not saying it will happen again like that, but it could. It could. Exodus 33, verse 14, and he said, My presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Whether you're speaking in the Old Testament, in the typical Exodus, or when you're speaking in the New Testament of the anti-typical rest, the rest is in Christ. And the symbol of that rest is the Sabbath day. So my appeal to my Protestant brethren is please don't judge us Adventists as legalists because we keep the Sabbath day. Throughout your own history, you have been in conflict with this day and it keeps coming back to you. And if you understand what it means, that it means accepting the righteousness of Christ and is as far removed from legalism as the East is from the West, then I would make an appeal to you. Instead of going through another Council of Trent and being reprimanded for not placing the Bible above tradition, even though in your new documents you have signed that you accept tradition, your fathers never did, 
I would make an appeal to you this time round to not harden your hearts, but accept the grace which God wants to give you and acknowledge it by keeping his day. Thank you very much. Hi YouTube, I'm Walter Feit from Amazing Discoveries. If you'd like to learn more or you would like to subscribe, then click visit our webpage, donate, share, and we would like to hear from you.